the other, another way the Fed can create money. Um, your bank needs a loan and um, doesn't have quite enough reserves, so it has to, and, and it wants to loan more money out and so on. So what your bank does is in the morning call up the Fed officer and its regional bank loan officer and say, we need a loan of uh, you know, $50 million. Okay. At the end of the day, the Fed officer says, you have the loan. Now, where's the money? All the Fed did was to go into the bank's um, reserve account, which is he held at the regional Fed, and simply credit $50 million to that bank. There's no money, there's nothing you can see, there's no printing. The bank then has the right to create $50 million of new deposits and loan them out at interest. Okay. So that's how the Fed creates money. Now let me uh, deal with uh, one other, um, or another myth, and um, that is that the Fed is necessary to protect us from the horror of deflation, okay? I call this deflation phobia, and it has swept um, the Fed and academic economists since the beginning, it's around 2000, okay? And it was promoted by Alan Greenspan and Bernanke himself. They saw that prices were falling in, the, in Japan um, very modestly uh, during the 1990s, and that Japan had, at the same time, a depression. So they mistook one for the cause of the other. <laughs> falling prices, we see, do not cause depression. Falling prices are a result of a healthy, growing, prospering economy, which we'll get to. Um, so what happened in 2002, when Bernanke was just a governor of the Fed, he gave a talk that, at first, no one really paid attention to. He wasn't the Fed chairman, they really just pay attention to the Greenspan, basically. But he gave a talk in November uh, in Washington here, um, November 2002. It was called Deflation, Making Sure It Doesn't Happen Here. Okay. And um, it had to have, have been cleared by Greenspan since he was a, he's a, he's a chairman of the Fed. And when he began his speech by affirming the belief, quote, that the chance of significant inflation, deflation in the United States in the foreseeable future is extremely small. Okay? So then, Shut up and move on to something else. Um, then he expressed confidence that uh, the Fed would make, take whatever means necessary to prevent significant deflation in the United States. And moreover, that the U.S. Central Bank, in cooperation with other parts of the government as needed, has sufficient policy instruments to ensure that any deflation that might occur would be both mild and brief. So why should we worry about it? Well, he wanted you to worry about it, because this was setting the stage for an enormous inflation that caused the housing bubble which I just talked about. Um, he added, so having said that deflation in the United States is highly unlikely, and I'm quoting him, I would be imprudent to rule out the possibility altogether. So this is where you begin to scare the American people. Well, he we went through a whole list of different policy instruments which the Fed could use, unconventional instruments, which it is now using now. So in 2002, he was setting out the agenda for 2008. Okay? So the Fed could use these instruments which is beyond regular open market operations, which I talked about, um, to stop deflation. And then he wrote the following. He said, the conclusion that deflation is always reversible under a fiat money system follows from basic economic reasoning. A little parable may prove, prove useful. Today, an ounce of gold sells for $300, more or less. Okay, he wishes. That was back in 2002. As a result of his policies, it's now selling for $1,400. Um, now suppose that a modern alchemist solves his subject's oldest problem by finding a way to produce unlimited amounts of gold at essentially no cost. Moreover, his invention is, is, is widely publicized and scientifically verified. And he announces his intention to begin massive production of gold within days. What would happen to the price of gold, Randy asks. And he goes on to answer. He says, if there's a potentially unlimited supply of gold, its price would plunge. Okay. Um, Immediately after the, the, uh, the uh, announcement. Now, he says, what does this have to do with monetary policy? He says, like gold, U.S. dollars have value only to the extent that they are strictly limited in supply. But the U.S. government has a technology called the printing press. Now, he understood that he wasn't just printing money. He says in parentheses, or today, it's electronic equivalent. That allows it to produce as many U.S. dollars as it wishes at essentially no cost. It costs about <coughs> two to four cents to to print a new four hundred dollar bill, and just to make create money at, um, in computers, almost nothing. 
By increasing the number of U.S. dollars in circulation, or even threatening to do so, the U.S. government can also reduce the value of the dollars in terms of goods and services, which is equivalent to raising the prices in the dollars of these goods and services. We conclude then, under a paper money system, a determined government can always generate higher spending and inflation. So what, what was he doing there? I mean, it's really a chilling task. What he's telling us is that we're going to risk scaring people into spending money to raise prices by threatening to inflate the money supply. Okay? That way lies hyperinflation, which is exactly what they're doing now. Okay, by announcing that we're going to have QE2, quantitative easing 2, of $600 billion, billion dollars. Announcing that in advance. Usually the, the Fed doesn't announce anything in advance. The Fed is very secretive. It releases its minutes months later. Okay, it only gives you, a, every time it meets the FOMC, it only gives you a very, very short um, uh, press release. Okay. So why would he be announcing this? To scare you and me into into fearing higher prices in the future and stampeding to buy things that we would need in the future, like homes, automobiles, and so on, buy them now, okay? And that's hyperinflation, okay? But let me just sort of refute that. What's bad about falling prices, okay? Is anyone, is anyone worried about the fact that HD TVs are falling in price? iPhones, I love it. I want all prices to fall to a nickel, okay? Because Falling prices in a, in a capitalist economy with a sound money like gold, which is what occurred from 1800 to 1913, means that goods are becoming more abundant. And that the increase in the money supply, in this case gold, is very, very slow. It's determined by cost of production and the demand for gold and industrial uses or in, in money. Um, so, in fact, really falling prices or ooh, deflation is really an increase in the value of money. It's the dollar being able to buy more. Okay, so uh, for example, um, let's take the case of deflation in the high tech industries. You could buy a mainframe computer from IBM, which would probably fill half this room, um, for $4.7 million in 1970. You could buy a computer today that's less than $500, and it's tiny, PC, that's more than 20 times, probably 50 times faster now. Okay, it has more memory than that computer. Prices have fallen by 90% overall in, in, in those industries, okay? Now, has that destroyed the, the, the computer industry? Has that caused massive unemployment? No. In 1980, for example, 490,000 PCs were shipped, less than a half a million. By, night, by the year 2000, 43 million units were shipped, okay? In the meantime, prices have fallen by 90%. When there is growth, and as a result of technological improvement, the capitalist economy, the fact that people save and invest more, what you get is falling prices and falling costs. So the, the profit margin doesn't change. Price and costs fall. So you do not get depression. Deflation does not cause depression. Deflation is evidence of a prospering economy, a growing economy. Okay, um, okay. Uh, there's a few other things I could say. But um, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll just say one other thing about QE2, and then I'll, I'll stop and I'll take questions. Um, so the, the Fed had claims that quantitative easing is necessary, um, which is another word for inflation, to restart our economy. Okay? So we had quantitative easing from 2009 to 2008 to about 2010, the first round of quantitative easing. It, it increased bank reserves by about 1.2, I'm sorry, by about, yeah, 1.4 trillion dollars, okay? Unemployment stayed above 9%. Now we have the second round, and now it's in November. Another 600 billion dollars of quantitative easing. Which remember, when it gets into circulation, it's gonna be multiplied by up to 10 times, okay? Causing a massive inflation in the US economy. What has resulted? Uh, I, did, I, I did some quick calculations very quickly. Um, for, for, we've, what, what have we seen the last few months? We've seen purchases of long-term treasury securities rising, which was basically quantitative easing was supposed to push the interest rates down, which it did for a while, but now as people expect inflation, they've risen from around 2.5% um, to 3.5% in the last year. That is the, the, the uh, interest rates on 10-year bonds. 
Um, we've seen mortgage rates going up. Mortgage rates hit a low of 4.25% last year. Now they're just, they just went over 5%, the average 30 year mortgage. Uh, I read that in the paper yesterday. Um, commodity prices have risen by 23% um, in the last year. Cotton prices have hit their highest nominal value since the Civil War. Um, in the last two years, the, the Fed has reignited the stock market boom. It's increased by 84% okay, in two years. So what's the uh, solution? Solution, outside of the initial step of auditing the Fed, to find out how cozy they were with all of these firms they bailed out, and whether or not they knowingly overpaid for the assets that they bought, and if they did, how much is this going to cost taxpayers and losses? Okay. You want to, we want to know all of those things. That's what an audit would do. But the ultimate solution is to abolish the Fed. Thank you. 